Hello, my name's Keith Rucker. So to start off this episode, this is going to be another one of those combination episodes where I got a lot of bunch of little topics that we're going to talk about. And, and uh, what's kind of funny is, is when I shot my last one of these, probably about a week ago, I made a comment and it really wasn't something I had planned on saying or anything like that, but I said, I need to come up with a name for these and uh, for these little episodes. And that prompted many of you guys out there to start making suggestions, which was great. Like I said, I really hadn't planned on doing that. It's just something that came out uh, in, in the video. Uh, but based on a lot of your suggestions on what I should call these episodes, uh, I have picked one. <laughs> and, and actually, uh, several of you made this comment. It wasn't just any one person. And I'm sorry, I don't even have the names of those in front of me that did. But you actually suggested something that I said uh, in the video, which was odds and ends, you know, a little, you know, it's just a little of this, a little of that, and I called them my odds and ends. So we're going to start calling these episode uh, odds and ends, and uh, that's what I'm going to go with. So thank you guys for making that suggestion. Uh, I appreciate it. So let's get going. So first thing I want to talk about in this one is also in the last video that we did, um, we had a little what's it episode, a little, you know, we, I showed you uh, a piece of machinery or a piece that came off of a, a piece of machine that uh, my, my buddy uh, Andy Knowlton had uh, it, that came with the lathe that actually came off a of military surplus and it didn't really go to the lathe that it came with and we were trying to figure out what it was so I took some video of it posted it on here and it did not surprise me one bit that you guys were able to figure it out pretty quickly. Uh, and Paul Compton is actually the one that, that came up with it. And I said, hey, if you know what it is, you know, I, I don't, don't just make suggestions. I want to see some proof, some evidence. And Paul, uh, he delivered. Uh, he came up with what it was. So what this is, is it's an attachment that was with a Seneca Falls Company lathe. Um, and it's basically a uh, milling attachment that you could put on the lathe to do milling. And, and the piece that, that we showed in there was the cutter block that goes on this. It mounts on the tool post of the, the lathe and it allows you to put a cutter on there similar to how you put on a horizontal mill. And then uh, using a universal head that would hold your work, uh, you could actually power that cutter. And the little line, a little drive shaft would uh, uh, hook up into the headstock on the lathe to power it all. So it was really quite a, an ingenious uh, little uh, um, design here and I, I had never really seen one of these before. I've seen some milling attachments to go on lathes but never anything uh, like this. So Paul, uh, man, you nailed it. Uh, you found this. Uh, you found the catalog pictures. By the way, this came from uh, uh, lathes.uk.co uh, website, I think. I'll put the address up there if I'm not saying it exactly right. Uh, but he found this on there and he said he just remembered seeing it somehow. It sparked a, it sparked a little memory and he started looking for it and, and quickly found it and provided the links here. So this is dead on uh, to, to what that part is. So we have positively identified this. Had a lot of really good suggestions from you guys out there as what it may have been. And I think what threw a lot of people off was, you know, I showed that little mark on the bottom of the piece, it was a stamp on there, and the stamp, and I didn't recognize it, it was so tiny, but the stamp is that of the U.S. Army Ordnance Corps, and a lot of you guys suggested it may have been a part off of a, a U.S. Army tank or, or artillery guns or something like that, maybe a sighting mechanism or something, uh, spe you know, just speculating based on that Ordnance uh, Corps logo on there. So I really can't explain why the Ordnance Corps logo is on there. We do know that these parts came off a of military surplus though. So I can only speculate that uh, you know this part may have been on the inventory of an uh, Ordnance Corps facility somewhere. Uh, you know Huntsville, Alabama, Redstone Arsenal is one of the biggest around and that's fairly close to where we are so it would make sense that maybe it came from there and who knows why they stamped that on the bottom like they did. Um, you know, it, it would be pure speculation there too, but that's the only thing I can come up with. I think that the stamp, the Ordnance Corps stamp though, is really unrelated to what the part was. But uh, again, Paul, you nailed it. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. You know, that was, that was fun. And, and, you know, again, matter of, of minutes really of within me putting it up there, you guys nailed exactly what it was. Doesn't surprise me a bit. 
All right, guys, I'll give you a quick update on the Vance Planer Matcher. I've had a chance, uh, again, just kind of doing some little small things on here. Uh, nothing requiring a lot of machining, just kind of cleaning things up and putting them back together. But sometimes it's these little things that seem to take forever, uh, as has been the case with this. So we showed you over here uh, the shifting lever uh, that we worked on before that changes the, uh, the belt shifter down there. And... I've come in here and, and just finished up. So if you look, there's now this little guard right here on here. And uh, you know, that turned out to be a, a bigger pain than I thought. You know, I said, okay, clean that up, put it in there and be done with it. Well, lo and behold, I, I put it in the bead blaster, sandblasted it down, I put a coat of paint on it. Um, Originally the screws that held it in there were just tapped right into the frame of the machine and they had broken off Well, I just drilled them out and uh, Put a bolt all the way through with a screw on the end Which actually they had screws on the other end just our, our nuts on the other end like this So I thought it was kind of redundant that it was tapped, but anyway, we got that on there and I tightened it down and wasn't paying attention to what I was doing and the handle was just barely out sticking out a little bit too far right here and when i tightened it up it um it broke that casting right there in the middle uh it was maybe just a sixteenth of an inch and when i tightened it down of course i had that pressure in the center it snapped that casting which you know you guys have seen me braze and i didn't do this on camera but you know it was a fairly easy quick brazing job put it back together um, made a few little modifications to get that handle down where it needs to be. Bottom line though is, you know, this putting two bolts in here and putting that little piece on right there, it, it took me took me nearly all morning um, of working on this thing. Uh, so anyway, we got that done. Also in here, uh, uh, you see the counterweights in here. And uh, these counterweights are, is what puts the downward pressure on uh, this, uh, the feed roller up here, this corrugated feed roller. So this will grip that rough cut board and pull it in. And if you look, there's two rods over here. Uh, one of them, this one here, it just kind of hooks up around the top and it goes down to the bottom down here where this uh, piece of metal is. And on the other side, you can't really see it, it's dark back there, but there's another rod that goes up and it actually is uh, bolted this. So that, that piece basically stays stationary and the weight pulling it pulls down on that and puts downward pressure on the infeed rollers. Well, we got all those back installed, and again, that was mostly just cleaning things up. Um, you know, we uh, put the the everything in the bead blaster, uh, cleaned it up, painted it, and reassembled it. It wasn't any any big big job to get those on there, but anyway, again, you know, I spent all morning and we got two weights put on and that little handle guard over there put on but uh, we're making progress so with uh, the little what's it thing that we did in the last video I thought we would combine uh, a what's it uh, for this video along with a little bit of viewer mail so I got a neat item in the mail the other day that was offered up to me this came from a gentleman named Roy Reynolds over in uh, Art, uh, Texas and uh, he contacted me and asked me if I wanted a particular item. And I knew what the item was, but it is a rather unusual item uh, that many of you may not know what it is. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna play this game a little different than the other guys. I'm gonna show you the item, let you take a look at it, uh, tell you a little bit about it, and let you guys guess. But we're not gonna make you wait a week or something to figure it out. Uh, you're either gonna know what it is or not. Uh, so we'll go ahead and let you know. But let me zoom you in on here so you can see this and uh, see if you know what it is. All right, so here it is, guys. So um, let you kind of look at it a minute here. We'll turn it over, turn it around, whatever, uh, and see if you guys can maybe have an idea of what this is. Um, so if you look at it, you got two arms coming off on it. You know, we got a little adjustable stop here on one of the arms, this moves back and forth. Uh, if you look on here, there's actually a scale to go along with this, it tells you, you know, one inch, two inches, it's marked, I think, in quarter inch increments uh, on there where you can tighten this down. Probably had a thumb screw on it originally, it's just got a regular uh, screw in there on this one. 
Uh, got this little piece here uh, that is on the arms. It slides up and down. Uh, and then, you know, it's, it's got this piece up here, kind of like the head of a compass or a set of dividers uh, that, that spread these apart. And it's got a little uh, piece in between it right here that is uh, kind of a, a fulcrum, I guess, to, to hold them apart. All right. Okay, that's enough of that. So what is it? Any guesses? Some of you will know this is, and I'll go ahead and tell you, it's not a machinist tool. Uh, so there's a clue. And I'm gonna go ahead and get the piece here that kind of makes it all come into, into light. So what this is, this is actually something that uh, was offered up to us to use at the museum because uh, the, uh, Roy knew that we do a lot of steam stuff out there. Uh, with our steam locomotive, our steam powered sawmill, we got a steam engine that runs a line shaft in a woodworking shop, we got a steam powered cotton gin, so a lot, a lot of steam related stuff. And uh, he said that this piece actually, uh, he said he used to work for the Huckleberry Railroad uh, in Flint, Michigan, and uh, uh, he knew what it was, and, and, and I'm sorry, I don't have it right here in front of me. I, I think that this actually came off of a different railroad in Arkansas, and I don't have which one it was in front of me, uh, but this was something that he picked up, uh, I think, at, at a railroad type place, and it is related to steam. Okay, so you have another clue. I'm gonna go ahead and just get to it. So what this is, is this is for cutting a sight glass, uh, and I got a sight glass here. And on your boiler, if you've seen my my, my steam engine related videos where I show our sawmill boiler or the uh, train boiler, there's a sight glass that shows the level of water in the boiler. And this is the type of a sight glass that we would use on, our, on the uh, sawmill boiler at the museum or on any of our stationary boilers. So the sight glass in the locomotive is a little bit different, but it has a, a glass in it. It's a little more protected. Uh, but basically, uh, you just had some pipes coming out of the boiler and it had a special connector where this uh, tube would be going uh, vertical and uh, you'd have water coming in or water and steam coming in from the top and the bottom and uh, it allows you to see the water level in the boiler using this. So what this tool right here is for is for actually cutting uh, these sight glasses. So when you buy a piece of sight glass, this is one that was broken that I just brought in as an example and it's got the little red line that would be behind it uh, to kind of help you see the water level. Not all, most sight glasses are clear. That's just how this one is. But what you would do is you would just slide this up over there to whatever length you want to cut it off. And then using this little uh, piece here as leverage, you can press, and there's actually a little glass cutting wheel right down here. And you got a little guide uh, that's the same diameter as sight glass. And you would just put that in there and turn this right here and you would score the inside of that piece of glass uh, to cut it off. So unfortunately, uh, the little roller in here on this one is really, really dull. We tried cutting one earlier today and uh, really weren't successful. Good news is though, is that this little uh, cutter is replaceable. It's, it's just got a little pin that holds it in place. There's a notch here. You can actually slide that pin and put a, a fresh cutter in there. So I'm gonna have to find me a source for a glass cutter disc and, uh, and replace that to get this working. Uh, but anyway, this is for cutting sight glasses. So you would score the inside of the tube and uh, uh, the way I was all, have always done is then we would take like a torch and just kind of run it in front of the flame and that would heat the glass up and the shock of heating the glass up where that score is just basically causes it to break all the way around and you just tap it and it just will break right along that line. Uh, so, but again, we need to get a new wheel uh, to go in this one. Uh, this is going to go out to the museum. Uh, you know, they actually have one of these out at the museum already, but you know, it's going to be nice to have uh, an extra one. And uh, like I said, we'll get a new fresh cutter in here. When we do that, it'll probably actually be in better shape than the one we already have. So uh, thank you, Roy, for sending this along. And uh, like I said, this will go out to the museum and I'm sure uh, that we'll have the opportunity to use it as we do maintenance on our boilers out there. 
back on the uh, furnace project here uh, where we started on this in my last video so this is the lid to my furnace that I use for melting down uh, brass and aluminum in we're gonna be using some for, for casting I need to make a repair to this uh, where uh, over time the bottom of this uh, lid this is actually the, the bottom side that's up right now but it had just been heated up so many times that it was worn out so I got a piece of uh, 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 high temperature insulation here just a, a, a one inch thick rigid piece and I've placed it in here I've actually come in here with some screws up through here to hold in place and we have kind of packed it down with this uh, refractory uh, cement in here and now what I want to do is I guess want to kind of glaze the whole thing over uh, with some uh, uh, basically furnace cement so this stuff is uh, uh, goes up to a temperature of about 3,000 degrees uh, without any problem uh, and it's just uh, basically a uh, kind of a mortar type mix. Um, you know, right now this this is a little bit thick for what I want. I got you know probably maybe maybe a third or a quarter left in this. I'm just going to thin it down with some water and uh, take a stick here and just kind of stir it up and get it a little bit thinner where I can spread it around. Let me grab a stick here. All right, so this is now the consistency that I can uh, work with it. And uh, we're just gonna kind of go around the, the outside edge of this and just kind of seal this thing in. And again, guys, yeah, I'm using my bare hands. Scary. Also going to work down inside the hole here. I got a gap down in here that just kind of needs to be glazed over on the inside just to make sure that that um, refractory doesn't come out of that hole in there. All right, guys. So this is uh, again pretty much ready to set over here and and dry for a couple of days. Uh, I'm probably still. A week away from firing up my furnace just uh, from the standpoint of getting some other stuff ready for it so we'll let this uh, just dry on its own and uh, uh, you know when we heat this stuff up, up the first time I'll probably kind of bring the temperature up slow and uh, let it get up to bake out any extra moisture that's in this thing basically before I just bring it completely up you know they recommend to heat it up to about 500 degrees uh, uh before you really start using it and uh, so we'll probably try to do something like that just to kind of get it ready uh for the furnace but i'm real happy with this uh, i think this is going to hold up real well and uh hopefully soon we'll be melting some metal so this is the next part of the advanced restoration project is um i've got this shaft with this pulley up on here this is the original that came right off of the uh, the old machine uh, it's just been sitting over here in the pile waiting to be uh, taken care of. So we haven't done any cleaning on any of this. I uh, hadn't even taken uh, the bearing, the Babbitt bearing blocks apart yet. We just unbolted it, slid it out from the machine and put it over to the side. So most of this is just cleaning up, doing some sandblasting, bead blasting. Uh, we're going to have to uh, put new Babbitt bearings in here obviously. This shaft is all frozen up. The, or the, the bearings are all frozen up. The shaft is really, really rusty. Uh, and pitted. Uh, I think I've got a piece of shafting uh, to replace this with so I think I'm good there. I can't remember what size it is but it seems like uh, I acquired a piece, a couple pieces of this size shafting a while back so I need to go verify that and make sure we've got that on hand but uh, I'm almost positive we do. But here's here's the, the big challenge. You know normally just putting a shaft in is not a big deal but here, here's my challenge. So when we started working on this machine uh, there were some pieces that were broken. There were some pieces that were just missing. And one of the pieces that was missing is one of these pulleys. So the way this works is, is you got, uh, there's another jack shaft that gets mounted right in here that has a bunch of pulleys on it. So the belt will come off of this pulley. The top of the belt goes up, it goes around the cutter head, it goes around, it goes over the top of this, and then it bends it down and goes around this pulley. And this is just kind of an idler this in here uh, to just get the angle of the belt where you have uh, a good wrap around both of these pulleys. If it was just a straight shot, you wouldn't have good contact on the pulleys, but by putting this uh, break in here uh, in that bottom of that pulley, 
you're going to get a lot better friction. And this top cutter head, uh, it has basically a pulley on each side. And just like this shaft, you got this same pulley on each side. The pulley on the other side is missing. So here's the challenge. I've got to get another pulley and it either has to be an exact match in diameter to this one because if the diameter of this pulley is off from that one and the, the pulleys on either end are the same, your sh shaft is going to be wanting to turn at different RPMs on both sides. It's going to cause a lot of friction on your belts and it's just going to cause a lot of problems. So I've either got to find another pulley, at least in diameter it matches this one. If it's a little bit wider it won't matter. Uh, or I have to find two pulleys with the same outside diameter that are close to the same diameter. This is just an idler, so if, if, this pulley, if this pulley is a little bit bigger or just a little bit smaller, within reason, it's not going to make a big difference. Uh, this shaft will be turning just a little bit faster or slower, but this isn't driving anything. It's just an idler, so anyway, I need to get some measurements on this and uh, try to track down a new pulley. So let me uh, grab my tape measure and see what we're looking for. All right, so the pulley that's on here is... about 17 and a half actually it looks like it's 17 and 5 eighths in diameter and uh, the face on here is four and a half inches and the shaft I'm gonna guess that's one and 15 sixteenths just going off the ruler here I need to get my calipers out you know, um, the, 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 again, I'm not worried, you know, I, I got to find a, a matching pulley and I'm going to go actually here in just a minute and the museum has a, a pretty good stash of old flat belt pulleys that they put together. We have a lot of line shaft driven equipment out here. So anytime we can pick these up, uh, we pick them up and uh, we've got a good collection. Uh, even though we got a good collection though, it seems like usually the one you're looking for is the one you never have. And I want to say I actually looked for one of these before and wasn't able to find one, but I want to go look again. It's been so long since I did that. I need to go dig through stuff and make sure I can see if I can find either a matching one or again two matching ones that are close to this. Um, the, the, big, the big deal is the diameters need to be exactly the same on both sides. Again, on the face, you know, I got four and a half inches. Uh, you know, we're probably going to be running a four inch belt. So, you know, if it was a quarter of an inch smaller or even wider, if it was uh, six inches wider, you know, it wouldn't matter. Um, the width isn't that, that critical. Um, and the hub size isn't that big. I can either bush it up or bush it down to make it smaller, or if need be, I can turn the ends of my shafts down a little bit. Again, within reason, it can't be too big, too small in diameter, but uh, I can deal with the, the, the bore size. Uh, I can't find one. So anyway, we're going to go on a search to see if we can find, get lucky and uh, find the right pulleys. All right, we got another piece of viewer mail I want to show you guys. And uh, this is something that I've actually came in, um, I don't know, it's probably been a month now, maybe even a little bit longer. And I've held off showing it to you guys uh, for a reason. And I'm first off, I'm going to show you what it is. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit of story behind this. And, uh, and you'll understand why I held off showing it. Uh, so long. So this came from uh, Dick, also goes by Richard Morgan, uh, I believe up in Ohio if I remember right. Uh, but he sent me a note a while back and uh, said this was an item that he picked up at a thrift store. Uh, and it really wasn't something that he needed, but he saw it and just thought it was neat and bought it and brought it home. And uh, knowing that in addition to doing metalworking, I do woodworking, he thought this might be something that I would enjoy. It was not something that he really felt like he had a need for. So, And first off, let me comment. He built this really nice wooden box to ship this in. Um, we did, it, this isn't the way it came originally, but this originally all went down nice and tight. He had some screws in here. Uh, the way it is right now, it won't go quite down in here. But anyway, that's not because of him. That's some stuff we've done since. Uh, but really nice packing job. And, you know, I really appreciate that because I'm again guys the, the these shipping companies are just getting worse and worse we got a box in the mail something my wife ordered uh, yesterday 
and it, it was just some clothing items and when the box got here it was busted open on the top and the bottom and I mean it wasn't like there was anything hard rattling around in there the, they just don't take care of stuff in shipping so if you're going to ship something and you got something nice go to some effort to make sure it's, it's really packaged well and and Dick you hit a home run on this one this is great so let me pull this out and, uh, and show you what it is uh, so there you go this is a uh, what's called a back saw it's a old antique piece of woodworking uh, tool and um, I'm gonna pull this off this is a little guard uh, that was put on here and again I get to this little the back story on this in just a minute but here you go so I'm gonna zoom you guys in on this so you can see this a little bit better all right so what you're looking at here is what's called a back saw and it's called a back saw because it has this little spline across the back that makes it rigid and it's used for all kinds of purposes uh, you would commonly use a saw similar to this like in a, uh, a miter uh, stand that would for doing cutting miter stuff so before we had chop saws you would use a saw like this with a little guide or a little block that it would go into but it was for making a straight cut and this back gave it some rigidity uh, for when you get into that cut to keep that blade from wobbling like you would with a handsaw. Um, and this one here is kind of special. Um, and uh, the reason is is that this, if you zoom in real close here, this is, it says uh, Henry Ditson. Now Henry Ditson or Ditson uh, saws have been around for many, many, many years. In fact, uh, the company I'm pretty sure is actually still in business today. Uh, but what makes this one special is is that it is marked actually Henry Ditson. So Henry Ditson started a saw making company in the mid 1800s. And uh, I, forgive me, I don't know the history on this as well as I should. But shortly, I think right after the Civil War, his uh, son came in and started going went, came into business with him, and uh, the name was changed from just Henry Ditson to Henry Ditson and Son. And then later, a second son, and I, again, I don't know the year, uh, I apologize, uh, but a second son came into the business, and it, the name of the business was again changed to Henry Ditson and Sons. And this one here is actually a Henry Ditson, uh, which means that this saw uh, would predate uh, around 1865 or predate the Civil War for all intent and purposes. Don't know exactly when it was made, but this is one of the very earliest. Henry Ditson back saws and you know this saw I mean it's what 100 and 140 almost 150 or I guess it is 150 years old so uh, it's pretty amazing that it's still around and that it's, it's in the condition that it's in which is actually pretty good condition so uh, anyway uh, Dick contacted me asked me if I wanted it and he told me he said he wasn't sure, but he thought this might be an old one. He'd done a little bit of research on it and thought it might be an old one, but he wasn't really sure. He wasn't a saw expert and uh, asked me if I wanted it. I said, yeah, I'd love to have it. Um, not so much because I'm a collector of saws, but because I actually have uh, some of these saws that I use in my shop. And uh, guys, you know, I, I guess you could say I'm a collector of tools, but as a general rule, uh, I don't really want to have a real high price, high value tool unless it's something I'm going to be able to use. I don't mind having a nice expensive tool, but if it's not something that I'm going to use, I'm probably not going to spend the money or really want to have that. Uh, I'm not just getting stuff just for the sake of collecting, I guess is my point. So anyway, when I got this, uh, it was kind of ironic, about the same time a uh, viewer of mine who I had, had met on a time or two or actually uh, uh, had been to a, a clinic that he did or a demo I guess maybe be the right word for it at a, at a Midwest Tool Collectors meeting one time I saw him give a demonstration on sharpening hand saws and this is a gentleman by the name of Jay Ricketts who lives up in the Atlanta area and Jay uh, is known at least to me as one of the uh, leading experts on hand saws around the world and around the country and, and Jay 
is a saw collector, a very serious saw collector, and has some very nice saws. I've actually seen some of the saws on display again at Midwest Tool Collectors meetings, and uh, you know he's got some really nice stuff. Jay contacted me on my channel. He's been watching my channel. He's been a friend of the Georgia Museum of Agriculture uh, for many years, and he, I think he has seen something on there about the museum. And he had just sent me a little note, um, totally unrelated to hand saws, and it was about the exact same time that this saw came in. Well. I immediately uh, sent Jay an email back and told him about this saw, uh, took some pictures. I had just gotten it, just taken out of the box when his email came in, took some pictures of it, sent it to him, and he said, yes, indeed, this is one of the old ones. And uh, then Jay offered something that I really wasn't expecting. He said, tell you what, send it to me, and he says, I'm going to go through the saw, I'm going to take it apart, I'm going to clean it. I'm going to restore it basically um, and sharpen it and all that. And so, me not being an expert on hand saws, I said, yeah. And, and knowing that it was a, you know, maybe somewhat valuable saw being as old as it was, I, instead of me trying to restore this one myself, I sent it to Jay and let him do it. And Jay kept it for a little while. And I, I just got this back from Jay uh, the other day. And, uh, I see he made the comment he said he, he uh, hand filed the teeth on here sharpened it he made a comment to me that the saw was actually in pretty good shape when he got it as far as the blade a lot of times uh, you, if you look at these old saws they'll be shorter on one end and the other because you typically saw more uh, in, toward the in front of the saw I think if I remember right and as they sharpen it this the blade will become tapered you know really and truly this saw hasn't seen a lot of use in the last 150 years uh, relatively speaking and uh, a lot of the blade was still there he actually said it was still pretty sharp when he got it but he went through and hand filed all the teeth reset the teeth um, he I think took the handle completely off the saw it has uh, the split nuts on it back here on the back uh, which will you see on these older saws uh, but he took the handle off he cleaned it out real good um, he uh, I think put a little shim back here in the handle to kind of make it a little bit stronger uh, carefully cleaned it with some steel wool and some renaissance wax uh, and uh, basically just did a, 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 a little bit of a restoration on it he did not uh, really remove any of the patina off of this saw he uh, just cleaned it carefully leaving as much of the original patina because stripping a saw like this down to bare metal uh, would really hurt the value more than help it even on the handle he cleaned it and waxed it but you know he didn't try to I mean there's I don't know what it is about hand saws and paint splatter but it's almost impossible to find a handle or anything on a, on a hand saw that have paint splatter on it and uh, this one is no exception you got a piece here and a piece here and I think there was a drip right here uh, and he didn't even try to take those off he just left them on there. that's part of the history of the saw it was stamped here uh, with the uh, owner's name, I guess, uh, J. Mess with uh, two E's and two S's, M-E-E-S-S. -S. Uh, so that was probably who owned this saw at one time. But Jay did a great job of uh, really restoring it. He even uh, took a piece of uh, curly maple, uh, some hard curly maple, and made a little guard for it and tied it up with this ribbon so that I can uh, put that on there and use that as a guard to help protect it. So anyway, you know, I wanted to show this off. This is a really cool, at least to me. Uh, again, I, I like hand saws. I have quite a few hand saws, again, the ones that I use. Um, I do woodworking. I hand cut all my dovetails when I'm doing dovetailing. I don't have a, don't even own a, a jig. I, I learned how to do it the old fashioned way. And, you know, I use a, a, a dovetail saw similar to this, a little bit smaller uh, for that. But I really like using hand saws. And this is gonna be a great, addition to my uh well i just said i didn't have a collection but maybe maybe i'm starting to get a few over here not a whole lot but it is definitely one that i'll use and jay assured me uh that this was a saw that he would not feel guilty about using it uh of course i'm going to take care of it uh i'm not going to abuse it but you know the condition on the handle uh, you know, it's got some wear on it from a collector standpoint. They would really want one that's a little bit more pristine condition than this. Uh, I have no idea what the value is on this. Uh, 
Uh, Jay never really told me, uh, but it's not for sale. Uh, <laughs> it's not for trade. Uh, this was a gift uh, that came in to me um, from, uh, from, from Dick and, and it's something that I'm gonna treasure and use in my shop for many years to come. So thank you uh, for Dick for thinking of me and sending this to me. And uh, thank you, Jay, uh, for taking the time to, to do this little restoration for me and send it to me. This is definitely a tool uh, that I will treasure. Well guys, after uh, digging through the pulley pile, I came up empty here on uh, finding either a match for this or a pair uh, that we can use. So, uh, anybody knows of where some pulleys are? Uh, either one that'll match this or a match set that's close to it? I'd be very interested in talking to you because uh, uh, I'm going to have to track this down. So again, you know, we're looking at, uh, that's about, get on this side of this. So that's just a touch over 17 and a half. So really and truly looking at it. So it looks like 17 and 9 sixteenths maybe 17 and 5 8 so I need to get something to measure this. It's, this. it's got a crown on this pulley so you know it's a little bit hard to measure right here on the edge by 5 inches wide and again I'm not worried about the uh, hub size I can work around that. Uh, I did find a 18 inch diameter pulley with a 5 inch face uh, that you know that might be a little bit easier size to find and really and truly, I've got, again, flexibility on the diameters here. Um, I would be fine putting anything from about a 17 up to an 18, maybe even a little bit, you know, bigger than that. I don't think I'd want to go much below 17, um, but I might even go as high as like a 19-inch diameter pulley if I can find a, a match set of them uh, to go on here. So. Uh, again, guys, if, if anybody knows where some of these pulleys are, these things are getting harder and harder to find. Uh, there's just not a lot of big uses for them anymore. Uh, they probably get used for decorations more than actually put into use. But out here at, at our museum, uh, you know, like I said, anytime we can find these things, we, we try to pick them up and put them in storage because a lot of this line shaft stuff out here at the museum, you know, we got to be able to find the right pulleys when uh, something we get something new in, we're trying to put it together, uh, or something breaks on something that's old, always looking for to, to get these things kind of in our stockpile. So if you can help me out with some pulleys, uh, you know, shoot me an email, krucker at friendlycity.net, and uh, see what we can work out. Thanks. So what good is a saw if you're not going to actually use it? So let's try this puppy out. So when I built my, uh, my workbench here, I put this little saw stop down here on the end. It just kind of folds up and it gives me a block to kind of put up here uh, for sawing. Usually I'm, I'm taking a hand saw and sawing off the end down here. Uh, and with a back saw like this, you're really not going to use it for cutting a piece off. You're typically going to use it for like cutting out uh, a shoulder on a tenon or something like that. So I've got a, a square line on here and uh, we're just going to hand held it, hold this in place. I'll come in here, drag that line a time or two, start into it a little bit. And I just cut about halfway down through that block. So if I was cutting a tenon off and need to cut a shoulder, it's a quick and easy way of doing it. A good sharp hand saw. Uh, a lot of times, guys, with a little bit of practice, this is actually faster than doing it on a machine. I use hand saws all the time in the shop for these little quick uh, jobs. Very often, uh, I find it easier to grab even just a cutoff saw on a, one little small part. Uh, it's quicker and easy to do that sometimes than it is to walk across the shop, clear off my, uh, my chop saw or whatever, uh, cut it, and then walk back to the bench. So anyway, great, great hand saw. I'm going to enjoy using it. So there you go guys, that's the very first episode of my new Odds and Ends series and thank you again for your suggestions uh, for that name and uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing that from time to time as I 
have a chance to do just a bunch of little small things and just edit them all together and throw them into a video. You know, really and truly, guys, I like to do more project-oriented uh, videos where I've got something I take you through a process from start to finish. But let's face it, there's just always a bunch of little things that go on in the shop, uh, and a lot of it is, is, I think, worthwhile sharing with you guys. So I hope you enjoy these. Uh, you know, sometimes the content may be a little bit basic, but, you know, I think it's good just to see how other people do things. And, uh, you know, you can always learn something. Uh, from watching someone else. I know I learn from watching other people all the times, and it may be something that I've been doing for my entire life, but see a new twist on something being done, and uh, suddenly that light bulb goes off and it gives you an idea of how you might be able to improve uh, your technique, even though it, it's something that you've been doing a long time. So anyway, that's my take on it, and uh, that's what we're gonna keep on maybe trying to do uh, as time permits. So again, uh, guys, thank you for watching the video. Uh, thank you to all my many subscribers out there. If you haven't already, if you like this, hit that subscribe button and you'll get a notice uh, uh, when new videos pop up. And uh, you can come back and, uh, and check out what's going on uh, as I'm working around the shop uh, doing all kinds of crazy things. And uh, again, thank you for all your comments. Uh, I really appreciate those guys. I really uh, enjoy interacting with you. Uh, you know, now. Now as I've been doing this, man, it seems like I come home every afternoon and it takes me an hour or so to go through all my comments and try to uh, follow up with some of you guys. So I'm enjoying it. It's been a lot of fun. I'm not complaining. I, I really enjoy it. So keep those comments coming. Uh, thanks again, guys, and we'll catch you next time.